So hi, everyone. This is the first group who will be graduating from the Nebula program, and we're very, very excited that you're all here. Um, we have been working and learning very intensely during the past weeks, and now this is uh, the time for us to learn from you and to hear about your, your progress, hear about your next steps in your open science journey. So we're very, very excited. I'm gonna start with our usual welcome announcements. Um, as always, this call is being recorded. If you prefer to keep your camera off, that's okay. Um, we also have automatic captions. Um, you can go to the top left corner of the Zoom and then and go to the link in other AI. Um, that will take you to the live captions. Um, and we will, upload this recording to you to our YouTube channel um, in the following days. Also, we have a code of conduct. Um, you know this by now. Um, what we expect from your participation in the program is that you are kind and considerate and respectful to one another. So if you experience any unacceptable behavior um, from any participant, including the organizers, please um, get in touch with Joe, Malika, or myself, um, the, the emails are in the notepad. And yeah, so those are our short announcements. You're familiar with them by now. Um, and now we can start with the project presentations. We will have three project presentations. Um, just as a reminder, everyone will have five minutes to present, and then we will have time for Q&A. Um, and if you have any comments or questions for people who are presenting, please use the notepad because that is where um, we can you know, keep track of, of the questions, of the comments. And people who are presenting can go back to the notepad and read um, your questions and comments and answer them, even if we don't have time to cover all of them during the session. And it's easier to do that um, in the notepad than in the chat, at least for this session. So I encourage you to keep an eye on the notepad and add there your comments and questions and share resources for people who will be presenting today. So before we start, are there any questions about um, the dynamic of the session? Okay, I see people nodding, so um, I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna get us started now. And the first presenter is Joanna. Joanna, are you ready to share your screen? If you are gonna share slides, yes, I'm ready to share my screen. Okay, and Malvika will take the time. Um, okay, I would very gently let my alarm play. So you would know that five minutes are over. Okay. I actually also set up my alarm, so. <laughs> Let me know when you can see my screen, please. Uh... So we can see your screen. Yeah, now it's in presenter mode. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So good afternoon. <laughs> my name is Joanna, Jana Usapia. I'm originally Ghanaian and I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering. I'm currently reading um, a, a Master's of Science degree in Medical Imaging and Applications. And um, I love volunteering. I blog about concepts I learned whilst I was training to be a data analyst. So um, before I joined this program, I'm a student and then I'm now being ushered into analyzing medical images. But then I realized that every time I needed to find a particular data, I couldn't find it. So when I saw the project, I knew that the problem was not finding the data set was because most of these data sets are not open. So what if there's a way we could have all our medical images open, which are easily accessible by anyone that wants to build projects just wants to build fun projects or really wants to research about something without having the resources to do a major research on a large scale. So I thought of an open repository where 
medical images are easily accessible. Perhaps if you want medical images from Africa, you could get it. But depending on what you want to do, right? But then during my research with my mentor, I realized that it was actually a much, much bigger problem or a much bigger concept to make medical images open and accessible because there are a lot of um, ethical issues that come to play and there has to be um, a plan for what you intend to do with the images from the collection part to the distribution part. But then I ended up drafting a data management plan for medical imaging images, right? Just in case in future, when I have to do a project, I could have something to show for it. So I use the opportunity to draft a data management plan. Yeah, so before the Nebula project, I, there were so many tools I wasn't aware of. But then during the project, the, the cohort, yeah, week after week, we got introduced to new tools. And even for tools that I knew how to use, like GitHub, there was like a new dimension to it as to how to license your code, the specific license to use, depending on what the future of the code you're writing. So I also, now I'm confident about what happens with general research from data collection to distribution of the publications, right? So these are things that I picked up during the cohort. And for every one of us here on the call, they seem to have done something substantial in their fields of endeavors and it was very inspirational for me. Regarding my projects through the cohorts, I'm able to have a deep appreciation for open medical data repositories. Sometimes you can Google on cargo, you can find images on cargo. And now I wonder how they are able to track who uses the data sets and for what purposes. I'm still very interested to find how open medical images work. So for the future, now I know how well to go about my future research works. And even if I would want to make them open, depending on who is funding it, I, I believe that now I have the skill sets to have the very best of ethical practice of when I'm doing my research. I am also very interested in a comment that was made during the open data session about working with private, private data openly. So overall, I understand that open science seems to be open, but includes at the same time, right? Because we would want more people to benefit from research. We would want people to have access to data. But then there's also the responsibility that lies on us as researchers to make sure that whoever's data has been collected is being protected and that there's, um, we are being meticulous about the data, how we are going to disseminate it, the processes we go through, and then how we can reproduce the research and licensing. So generally, that's, that's all I learned from the cohort. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I just uh, loved hearing your reflection about how open is really a spectrum and not just something that is or either open or, or private. Um, so yeah, do we have any questions for Joanna? Feel free to raise your hand, grade them in the chat or grade them in the notepad. Joanna, we are still seeing your, your screen. And okay, like, sorry. Oh, yeah. well, that's good. Um, yeah, we have a comment on the notepad and they're still grading, so let's wait a few moments. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also like, like really hearing that you're thinking ahead of future projects. So, what do you anticipate might be some challenges that you might face working with medical data? So I think with medical data, I used to think the major problem was with anonymizing the data. And during one of the sessions um, with the problems in making data open, someone mentioned that it's because people don't have the required technical skills to make data, um, to anonymize data or even manage their data, that's the problem. But I think there's also the um, ethical, political aspect of 
um, using medical data where whoever has the data sets is able to build like the best models. So then maybe people would want to monetize the data. So I think there's like a bigger problem other than just anonymizing their data or being able to um, take the, the human aspect of the data and then just render it in the data form generally. Yeah, and this is related to one to the question that people were writing in, in the notepad about, because you have thought of already about the challenges. Have you thought about ways to protect uh, medical images while making, making them open for necessary research? So I think with um, medical images, um, the major issue is the personally identifiable um, data, like people's names, their personal information that we could trace to them. That's what makes it, um, yeah, that's the human aspect of the data. But then once we are able to, I, I realize that if you would want to make the data open, there has to be like strict ways where you clear out the um, personally identifiable information. So generally for that aspect, there's a way to go about it. And the last question that we're gonna cover is, where in your next stage could you need some additional support or resources and where could you look for that? Okay, so um, for what I realized, if you would need data, let's say MRI images from Hospital X, you need to um, probably write a proposal to them, tell them the entire cycle of the data, and then they, they would have like ethical board meetings to see if whatever it is you want to do is the best or not. So I think the major problem would be the policy aspect of it, because if you would want the data to be open for people to play with it, then it would be up to the ethical board to say if whatever, I mean, whether your motives are the best because of which they should release the data to you or not. So I think unless I'm probably working on a particular project and then I'm able to tell them this is what I'm using the data set for from A to Z, then I think that's the difficult part. So I mentioned that I'm very interested in how cargo, there are data sets that are available on cargo and then you don't know, they really don't know if I, I enrolled in the projects and then what I'm going to do with the data sets after I'm done with the project. So that's a part that I think I'm still like dark on and I don't know how Kago does it, but generally it's the ethical consideration that has to come with being given the data. Yeah, I think that's a major problem and how to solve it. <laughs> I think if, <laughs> if I have a specific goal, like maybe for my final year project, then they could consider giving the data to me, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanna. That it's thank really you. great seeing um, your learning, hearing about your learning and your progress. There are a few more questions in the notepad. If you can go back and maybe answer them there, um, and please, everyone, give a round of applause to Joanna. Thank you. Thank you. So the next presenters are Anna, Luciana, and Vivian. Are you ready to share your screen? Hi, hi everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Luciana will present. We will um, present um, our our research, and so just I will I will say thank you very much. And uh, until last year, I was director of human rights protection in Brazil, and uh, we were always discussing how to open data because in Brazil we have lots of uh, closed uh, data and uh, it, it's a prejudice, it's not good for political po politics, 
in general. So thank you very much. Uh, this course was was wonderful for 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 us. Thank you so much, Anna and Luciana, for for this group, for this team, to the to the research. First of all, I would like to my I would like to to thank my my class, uh, my colleagues, and uh, as well as uh, Joana said, uh, we think there is a an an before and an after the nebula cohort in our lives because we have learned a lot in this in this process about the open sources, about open data, about uh, uh, share research. And uh, I'm a PhD candidate in, in Brazil, in São Paulo, in University, University of São Paulo. Uh, I, my, my personal uh, field of, is, uh, of, uh, of interest is about the intersections with AI and the children and regulation. And uh, thank you, you all, because it was a, an amazing time to be with you in this, in this month. And uh, thank you for all the organization. Uchi. So, hi all. Thank you so much for the opportunity of being here. We learned, as my colleagues just mentioned, a lot throughout this process. And my name is Luciana. I'm a public defender in Brazil, and I'm currently working at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I was sent here by the Public Defender's Office and I will briefly present our project. Can you hear me well and see my screen? Yeah. So our project is on using AI and open sources to protect human rights defenders. And just to give you a context, Brazil is the fourth country in the world regarding the killings of human rights defenders. We have an average, unfortunately, of three killings per month. And from 2019 to 2022, Brazil recorded 1,171 cases of violence against human rights defenders. And of this total, 169 were unfortunately murdered. So what we aim to do and the problem we aim to address is how to use open source and AI to provide information to human rights defenders on the levels of risks they are facing. And one big obstacle and something that does not exist yet, it's the objectification of the risk, which means it's necessary to make the risk objective, so which could be done by means of network algorithms. So we want to move from a self-perception of the human rights defenders of, of, of the risk through something that can be objectively measured and the next step is to establish the metrics of the degree of risks. So among the benefits of ob objectifying the risks is the personal autonomy and self-protection. Um, the objective, the, the data will be objective for authorities that provide protection and also that will like, go on process to protect them and the possibility of action in international human rights courts. So you have, you can like prove the risk there and also the inclusion in legislative proposals. Um, in our project, project, we worked with three like core values on using AI and open source to this protection of human rights defenders, which is explainability. The systems we use must be, must be explainable so that the human rights defenders can understand what uh, how the, the system is doing this, which is also connected to transparency and non-surveillance. On the non-surveillance side, we aim to focus that the human rights defender must receive information on his, himself or herself rather than the government so that this person is not like going through a massive surveillance through the use of open data and open, open sources to that captures and uh, measures the risks they are facing. So, and the hypothesis we have is that using codes and AI technology, we can research open data to map the risks human rights defenders are facing and a combination of name, geolocation, key threat uh, phrases will provide information on the risks. And those risks will be then classified by levels and sent to human rights defenders. 
Uh, and this approach aims at reducing the risks of death and attacks against human rights defenders. Uh, so to sum up the project concerns about the protection of human rights and environmental defenders and artificial intelligence of things with an emphasis on early warnings and the protection measures in the virtual space, especially through social media. Uh, technology companies and open sources that we have a lot of data there and that we've adequately used can contribute to timely information on risks, conflict management and save lives. So what, which are our next steps, the questions we have and where we need like contributions from the community here and also if you know about other persons that could help us, we would be very happy if you could help us on this regard. So we are now defining the databases of search and developing a framework on risks. We're thinking through this. And then we need to find a tech partner to, like we, the three of us are human rights lawyers. So we need to find someone in the technology field, a partner to develop it. And then we will develop a small pilot evaluate, refine, and then pilot again, and then uh, hopefully expand. And that's basically it. Thank you very much. My colleagues probably want to add something to that. Thank you so much, uh, Luciana, Anna, and Vivian. Um, do we have any questions for the team? Okay, there are people writing in the notepad and while they finish writing their questions, um, I was curious about your experience uh, with your background in law and learning about open science. What intersections did you find between these two fields or areas? Well, I, I can start because uh, this, this uh, field is a totally new world for 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 the uh, law people. I think for the for the law students, uh, we have many uh, different types of research and uh, to share research. And uh, we, I think, the the uh, nowadays with the issues that are arising that are global issues that impact all all countries about, uh, for example, in my field of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we need a global regulation, we need a global approach. I think it makes uh, uh, a lot of sense uh, to, 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 to stay here and to, to learn more about these kinds of, uh, of ways to, to, to lead with uh, our achievements and, and our uh, uh, studies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Viviana. Viviane. Thank you, Luciana. For me, um, I, I was always thinking about how to how to do this, but I didn't know that the name, that it was open science. <laughs> and I usually use a Google Drive for my researches. And uh, I, 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 I was usually sharing Google Drive and uh, using academia.edu and uh, sharing my projects, sharing my classes and uh, trying to involve uh, more, more people with these researches. And so I have more than uh, 100 uh, Google Drive links. <laughs> and uh, now that I know that what I was trying to reach and uh, what platforms uh, are used for this and how to do this, for me, it's, it's a great, uh, uh, it's a great uh, evo evolution and it's a great um, opportunity to to understand that is that is how how to do and what are you doing uh, in open science field thank you very much just okay, to add, uh, uh, yeah can i just Luciana, add to that no i just wanted to remember one moment in the course when you presented us the github and i just thought that's a whole new world we learned so much so i think we really expanded our horizons here thank you so much so the question in the notepad is 
what are the data sets that you're analyzing for early warnings? So we are looking in through social media and with the publications which are open. We are still defining it, but we are trying to find everything which is online and that could be captured through like a Google search, for example, with the, those keywords, but especially like social media, which is open. And we are also trying to think through other sources. So if you have any great feedback on this regard, we would love it. And great suggestions on this regard, that's mo most helpful. And also one of the hopes we have is to partner with some tech company, which would make this data open and would also help us with with this but let's let's see if you know about any partners please let us know that will be also super helpful because we we want partners rather than like paying someone to do the the, the the tech part to have something sustainable and that we could like improve over time and yeah that's basically i don't know if Anna and, and Vivi. yeah i I um uh I I we could probably help you so I should I should follow up with you. So one of the projects we worked on was um a police score database where uh we would collect we would ingest data from social media and and police reports and different uh intake uh in different data sets where you would pick up the chatter about police conduct. And uh, and so the police, they watch those scores it's like their report card, you know, to make sure that they're not uh, misbehaving because uh, police conduct has been a big thing in the United States. Um, and uh, so that may be similar type of project. Um, and the National Institute of Justice is is active in this area, at least in the United States, and uh, and actually gave us a small grant to do some work in that area. So might might be I can refer some people and uh, talk to you further about it that might help. Well thank you so much, Andrew. Maybe we can like schedule a virtual cafe so that my friends Anna and Vivi can also participate. And even like one day I know that you're close to DC one day have a coffee somewhere here and we would love to learn more about that and to think through venues to developing it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see more resources being shared in the notepad and other organizations working on similar things. And there are a few other questions. If you could uh, go back to the notepad and maybe answer them there. Um, and please uh, give, a, give Anna, Luciana, and Vivian a round of applause for their project. So our last presenter today is Esther. Are you ready to share? I'm sorry, who did you say, Irene? Oh, oh, I was muted. Sorry, sorry for yeah. that. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, we can see your GitHub repository. Oh, yes. You can see the presentation right now. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you everyone for having me. Before starting, I will ask you to pretend not to have seen this title, Sauve Pal. And I hope that as you follow through with me in the presentation, it will gradually make sense as I connect the dots. So I am Ezra Sopa, an undergraduate student, and I have a lot of identities. But today, the cap I want to wear is a researcher. I love uh, conducting research so much so that instead of spending time posting my pictures on social media, I'd rather ask questions maybe stupid for some people, things like, uh, why do you post statues or why do you have a profile picture and all the other things. And why doing this for some time, I've noticed that in the end, sometimes I have an idea of the 
result of the research of the questions before asking them. But in the end, the, what comes out is totally different. And that process is really exciting for me to discover that I was wrong in my predictions. So my research was an open source system for data-driven insight into African brain gene and potential. To add some context to this, I will give you an example. The richest man in the world, Elon Musk, is a native South African. He moved to the United States when he was 17. And many years later, I think from what I see on social media that he identifies himself more as a US citizen than as a South African. My question was to know what makes the African diaspora to stop being Africans in the diaspora at a point in time. This was what mattered to me more in this research I was undergoing. And having this data, I think collecting this data from the African diaspora, I'll be able to make it available for policymaking by government to model statistical data. And the other aspect of my project was to create an open source system that will automatically collect and publish this result to the public and create a platform to connect uh, Africans diaspora with their respective countries so they can help support or initiate projects. But I was shocked in the process because when I was through the review process, I was really, I was reviewing, uh, uh, I was reviewing literature on websites and articles and everything. I fell on Dr. Nasi's article that was literally my project with, and he had even expanded it to some aspects that I never thought about. He had basically answered all my research questions and I felt like I would not be able to move any further with this research. It was really frustrating for me. And I also discovered through his article, the African Jasper Network, that did just what I wanted to do with my platform. They had created this platform through their programs to empower African Jasper and to capture talent in Africa or rising ideas and support them with funding. They created that ecosystem that I wanted to create with my research. So this is the moment where my coach became very handy because I was talking with him to know which other orientations I can give to my research project. And while talking with him, it happened that I was in paying a visit in the federal and the Russian Federation. And right there, I discovered that to come to the Russian Federation, I had a lot of trouble to exchange money to get the currency. Why? Thinking about it with my coach, I discovered that the sanctions in Russia is affecting, in a way, the ability of the African diaspora to send money back to their countries. And I remember what I read from an article published by the African Development Bank that $95 billion was remitted to Africa by the diaspora in 2021. And in that year, it was far more, like 10 times more than the direct foreign investment in the African countries. So this is on an undeniable proof of the power that the African diaspora have to shape the economy of their respective countries if they really connect back to their roots. Mm -hmm. So this became insightful for me and I decided now to focus my research on understanding the impact that these sanctions on the Russian Federation has on the ability of Africans that live in Russia to actually send money back to their countries. I conducted the research and the survey and it was really nice and interesting and some data agreed with my initial hypothesis and predictions, and there is no official information about how the Africans have to manage this issue of sanctions. And equally, there is no direct way they can send money back to their countries. And many has been have been victim of scams because of this. So it actually prevents them from sending or to of remitting back money to their countries. And it made me notice during the process that. Collecting data is something difficult. It is actually difficult because I took time to craft the survey and I shared it in groups that reach thousands of people. But I was shocked that the response was not even 20% of that because when I talked with people, they told me that they find it difficult to click on links to be redirected to other websites in order to fill a form. That is basically difficult for them. And most of the community of uh, the African diaspora here in Russia, they were in Telegram. So I thought it wise to build a, a chatbot that will make the process more easier, not just for me to collect the data for this research, but also for a lot of researchers. If we could use AI and a chatbot on Telegram to automate the process of creating, collecting, analyzing, and publishing results of surveys for researches, it will be helpful for everyone and probably make things better in the research community. So my favorite 
open science moments doing this project was the mentoring session with my coach and actually my survey from it was so open and it was thanks to this program because I made it very clear it the form was so open I, I don't even know how to explain it I gave them details on how I will manage the data I'm collecting I made it all the questions were almost optional. I gave them licenses, like it was so clear. I even had congratulations for the form, not even for the research after publishing out. And what was interesting also about the form is that it was fair and open, open in the sense that I didn't collect any personal data from the people, from the respondents. And at the end of the, responding to the form, they had the ability to actually see the results of the form. This was important to me because at the end of the form, I asked questions to know things like, how do you right now manage the situation of sending money back to your country or to receive money I meet the sanctions? And that will be helpful to the other respondents because there are people that learned after answering the form. They had a short time to have access to the previous responses and to make the ease, the, to learn also to get insights from what other people are doing in other countries in the same situations like them. And the overall process and writing open source code was an, indeed my favorite part of the project. And to show you the extent to which um, this process was uh, really interesting to me, I would like, with your permission, to actually show you uh, the repository. Uh, I had it here for a while now. As yes, you are um, just on time, so okay. can we? Uh, okay. Please, you, just you can seconds. share the link just a few seconds. Uh, oh, just yeah. a few seconds I beg. Okay. So this is the repository I, I built. Uh, I started writing open source code for survey pilots done in Python. And this is the first time in my life that I do a repository with this much amount of documentation. And it was thanks to Joanna's session that I learned how to do all these things. And I even went further to even add uh, a whole page and why I give credits to all the people that has be, had been useful to me while building this. And I added a log where I share the bugs or the errors or the fixes that I made during the development process. And this makes it easier for people to join me along as I'm developing this and build this together. So I invite you, if you're passionate about writing open source code like me to join me and contribute to this project. Thank you. I think I'm done. Yes, thank, thank you so much, Andres. Uh, can you share the link to your repository and your project, maybe in the notepad or in the chat? Um, Definitely. I, I'm really, really impressed that you did a whole project from scratch and uh, changed directions along the way. Um, yeah, do we have any questions for Andres? Okay, maybe as other people think about questions, um, I do have one. Um, okay. Yeah, so what would you say are your next steps? Because you shared like two areas of your work. The first is the uh, research on diaspora, um, and then the other is developing this tool. So I understand that they go hand in hand, but if you had to kind of Give us an overview of your next steps. What could that be? So firstly, the next thing I'm doing is that um, right now, most of the functionalities aren't yet that functional on the survey, but and I would like to really create a community around this and build it with people and make sure that it is a powerful tool that empowers researchers in the world to do surveys in a seamless and stressless manner and get a lot of people to respond. And the other aspect of my next step is that I've been opportune to join a small satellite project research group where I'll be contributing in a satellite research project. And I really look forward to applying all the open science tools and resources and knowledge I got from this program, doing my participation in that research with other people from different countries. Okay. We have a few questions. Um, okay. Does your tool analyze the survey information that it collects? It is. It does analyze, but it is not actually analysis. Analysis. It just gives statistical report and it displays the results with graphs in a document and sends it to you. It it is just high level analysis, if I can call it like this. So it is still up to you to use the data to derive the insights 
that is pertaining to what the research was for in the very first beginning. And another question is, um, they're still writing the question. Could you consider aspects other than sanctions for the difficulty in transferring money? They, they are there are definitely other reasons that uh, impact the ability to send money in the country. Like if you go through data, I, I said that in 2021, like more than 95 billion were invested by the African diaspora in their respective countries. And with the sanctions, this value is going downwards, not upwards. So the sanctions is just part of the reasons, not maybe not the main reason, but part of the reasons why the African diaspora cannot invest anymore like they used to in the country. And my research is a proof of that. And that is the angle I'm focusing on. May, though there might be other reasons as well. Okay, yeah, so there are a few more questions and comments on the notepad. Maybe if you can share the link to your repository over there and also um, go through the questions that people are also sharing and answer them, that would be great. Um, and so please give everyone, give, give, please everyone, give Ezra a round of applause uh, for this amazing presentation. And with that, uh, that's the end of our session today. So we have three presenters and we had a lot of time for a q and A. It's always really nice to hear um, about your progress and your learning and hear how everyone can maybe contribute a little bit um, with, it, with one another. So um, I just want to share a few announcements. Next week on Tuesday, we have the rest of the presentations and maybe we won't take as much time with Q&A, um, but please, if you are able to join and su to support your other colleagues in the cohort, that could be also great. Um, people who share the slides, we have a community in Senodo. You are welcome to upload your slides and we're gonna add you to the, um, add your, yeah, your presentation to that community. And that is like a repository that OLS um, uses to kind of collect all the presentations that people have shared in the past. Um, yeah, so again, it, it's been great learning about what you've been doing. And I just enjoyed um, hearing you all connect very, very different concepts that we have been covering in, in the in the program and also hearing about your next steps. Um, and yeah, yeah, I agree with Malvika who's sharing in the in the chat that all these presentations were very, very inspiring. Um, so again, um, I I don't have much else much to say, but maybe Malvika. Um, so delighted to be here and listen to all of your work and uh, just also want to thank Irene who's been endlessly working at the background and trying to make sure that this cohort is delivered to the perfection, although this is the, just the pilot. Massive congratulations, Irene, and also massive congratulations to those who have graduated today. And I'm also looking forward to the future graduation calls. I'm just very glad that I, I get to see this and be part of this. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, so if your coaching sessions are still ongoing, don't worry about the timing. You you have you still have like two weeks to finish that. Um, but yeah, congratulations on completing and um, getting to this part of the program. And with that, I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>